ever since anime is easily available online, I don't feel the pressure to ride the tide with the most recent seasonal anime. Probably one of the worst setbacks for someone who is trying to talk about anime on this platform. But what shows will be watched in what occasion is mostly depending on my mood. So really, anything goes. Except maybe Slice of Life which I'm in need of slotting at least one in between every shows I have finished. It is also because of that, older or classic anime are always within my consideration when I'm browsing my catalog. Digging through the box, I came across Macross, not really a mecha enthusiast myself back then. But for those that I had the leisure to experience, they have all stayed as some of my favorites for various different reasons. So the genre has definitely far proven itself to be something I could enjoy, turning me into a mecha lover, and subsequently shattered a typical preconception that has associated with the genre. With that enlightenment, I committed myself to dive into the very first installation of the franchise, hoping I could learn more about the genre from one of the legendary titles, one that's considered a legacy of them all. And oh boy, I was ecstatic. To be totally honest, my expectation jumping in wasn't an optimistic one. Because of how anime were made in the earlier days, there were just some innate technical problems that stick out to those who are used to digitally produced anime. Things like how when the camera pans, the movement is a little shaky, or some timing issues on the voice acting with the lip sync, and some cuts are a little awkward. All these are notably absent at this day and age, simply because technological advancements have them covered. Suffice to say, my appreciation of the medium has always allowed me to look past these problems and view them as what it is. The sort of knee-jerk, repellent reactions some people have whenever they hear it is something from the 90s or earlier doesn't occur to me. The fascination towards the fact that a bunch of people actually made this happen, or how influential they ended up become in retrospect, to the point where shows these days are still paying homage to them. All these contribute towards my acceptance and deep appreciation of classic anime. They are history to the things I love, and it turns out looking backwards will only strengthen my love for this medium. The first thing that came to a surprise in my initial impression was the aesthetic of the show. To me, mecha shows had always come across as a genre that would appeal to, well, people who love rat looking giant machines. While I know the majority of mecha shows do not bind their narratives around the machines themselves, most of them are just tools within the universe more than anything, they nonetheless have very marketable designs that appeal to those subset of fans who would spend money on buying their merchandises, mainly figurines. It is how Gundam and the craze that was Gunpla has been so successful to begin with. In fact, back in the days, toy companies act as the sponsors. So whether a show gets a green light or not, it is up to them and the potential of the toys. So it is a no-brainer that the design of the main machine has to be on a standard where it could attract potential customers, so to speak. By the hands of the god of Mecha, Kawamori Soji, the aesthetic of the machines in this universe do not feel eye-catchingly attractive nor do they feel like pampering to the imagination ideals of science fiction. It employs a design approach that is quote unquote realistic in mirror to our reality. They are portraying believability of how technology advancement could be perceived in the far but possible future, instead of fantasizing way beyond the current. A much more grounded aesthetic that matches a very human story. Macross itself looks like a giant floating capital ship. The land warheads look like giant tanks with legs attached underneath. The Valkyries, more known as the variable fighters throughout the Macross franchise, are designed over jet planes that resemble closely to those of our real life counterparts. For the crucial Batroid mode, instead of an eye-catching headpiece on the forehead most mechs in the market adapt, we have some plain looking antenna tubes. I thought all these choices say a lot about the design principle behind the machines. For it didn't have the flashy exterior to attract attention, the concept of transformable machines backed it up. 
and translating that complexity into a toy was said to be a milestone for toy engineering at the time. Some of you may think this is due to the time in which the show was made. Because it is quite an old show, the design or rather, the imaginative capabilities of futuristic concepts in the past lagged behind our current standard. How far stretched could the designers envision back in the days may only be as far as or even lesser to our current predictions of the future, right? But if we look back at sci-fi media that precedes Macross, higher concepts and designs had already existed. So if they wanted to push even further in technological advancement within the sci-fi sphere, there's no reason to hold back. The thing is, they are holding back for good reasons. These designs are deliberate choices to depict a war story they wish to tell. They would rather have designs that are befitting with the world they are trying to present than focusing on romanticism towards technological advancements. Warheads owned by humanity, while ported into a fictional world, still hold the same meaning. A prime example of extravagant is not always necessary. For the more eccentric designs, they left it for the alien race to portray the sense of unknown. That said, strip away the immense power mechs usually provide for humans to cling to, Macross puts that weight on humanity themselves. Culture and resolve as the strongest weapons. Despite impossible hurdles from friend and foe, we find a way to bridge through. Stubbornness of clinging to life, do not comply to defeat even when the whole world turns against us. All these concepts, along with the aesthetic choices, were able to unify as one to offer a more grounded to reality experience. When they say mankind and culture, it was our reflection. This is the appeal I'm getting from the expressions of this show, as someone who approaches the Macross franchise the very first time. Another core of Macross is the blend of human relationship dramas in relate to the threat of the alien entity humanity is facing. Note that I said relationship dramas and not political driven ones. Both conflicts present how human, as tiny as our existence, adapts with inescapable situations that rise before us. The scope between a space war that spans beyond the galaxy and mere human relationships might seem distant in terms of significance, but really they fall under the same spectrum against a common obstacle called struggle. Macross covers both ends without compromising either side. The greatness of mankind and all the self-indulgent emotional connections human partakes. And it is both of these ends that give each other strength, mutually sharing the same determination, affecting each other while moving onwards. A clear example would be the relationship between our mains, Ichijo Hikaru and Lin Minmei. Hikaru decided to join the military with a half-hearted determination in order to protect what was important to him at the moment, which was Minmei and her ever-sparkling dream. It is also because of that distance grows between them. Different environments led to different world views, granting each of them different values and priorities to uphold in life. In the end, those who share a closer outlook resonate stronger with each other, and those further, we admire their shines from afar. Yet it is Min Mei's songs from the opposite spectrum of war that saves the world. You see, without any of the sides supporting each other, humanity will simply fall. While the very idea of songs being the ultimate weapon that saves the world might sound absurd, I think this implication contains more backbones than what it could be perceived on the surface level. It is not as silly as people usually credited it to be. Really, it is not some sort of nonsensical logic, but rather simple. Music represents what humanity has cultivated throughout the history. Culture, the bane of the alien race and the one thing they lack. Comfort, joy, sadness. All sorts of emotions music could evoke fascinates the aliens, who only had basic primal instincts to rely upon, that are violence and conquer. 
with the same genetic root, the alien represent humankind as well but on a lesser path of evolution, what we would have become without culture, its potential to subjugate instincts that disrupt our coexistence as a whole, and even nurture equal unity without discrimination the decisive factor that separates us from them, making us higher beings above animals which prioritize domination. And the transmitter is the singer, representative of mankind, loved by all Minmei to amplify the effectiveness. As for the tool of influence, it is none other than pop music, the medium that propagates. With this in mind, it is pretty straightforward as to why songs and idols play a huge part in Marcos's narrative. From the setup to the conclusion, the power of influence, unite, and negate conflicts, the very meaning of make love not war. Though it is a little unsettling that Minmei's singing will be directly weaponized at a crucial moment for the sake of survival, then again sacrifices are required to achieve peace. Nothing stays pure in the face of war. It is also worth noting that the last arc, after the final battle with the aliens, is something I consider crucial for Macross's story to delve in and conclude as what it is. The show could have ended along with the climax of the war. Love wins, humanity grabs on the glimmer of hope and lives on, with the aliens accepting their genetic similarities with mankind and starts living together under the influence of culture. What else could top that as the closure of an epic tale? But the story took an extra U-turn to pull its own legs down all over again, presenting the uncertainties of the post-war, seemingly making a point saying nothing lasts forever, prying open other challenges the world couldn't escape moving onwards after obtaining that temporary peace. Racism, the unavoidable fate of another war, and some answers to the unknown, all disrupt the momentary relief that is, the truce between humanity and the aliens. While these elements build up uncertainties enough to convey plenty of discomforts, what's interesting however, is that the story no longer focuses on the threat of mankind extinction but human drama. Now, I imagine some people might not find this arc to be as engaging as what has already been presented. After all, the stakes being human extinction seems to have been resolved. There are lingering threats hinted briefly, but they aren't any immediate dangers and ultimately did not befall within the story being told here. So to those who anticipated another high octane climax, it could be disappointing or downright underwhelming. But to me, it is the resolutions among the relationships I find appropriate as an endnote for a very human story like Macross. We have Hikaru and Hayase Misa, both push and pulling from expressing their true feelings toward each other, and Minmei who is trying to requite her feelings towards Hikaru. A complicated love triangle has to come to a conclusion now that war has adjourned. It is also in this arc we explore the more complex side of the ever lovable Minmei, bringing a perfect superstar to a much more relatable realm I would say, stripping away the usual prestige that has framed upon her throughout the entire show before this point. Minmei's massive popularity trickles away after the war, so does her influence. Now that war is over, humanity abandons her along. She, who used to provide strengths and hopes, has now lost sense of her own, clinging back to those who she supported instead. And her newfound love for Hikaru does not spark from genuine feelings, but rather a self-affirmation move, one that is tainted with selfish motives. Hate her or love her, Minmei's character has become much more interesting because of this development. A reason star ironically invited the decline of her stardom because of the peace she brought to humanity. The cruelty, realizing that her popularity was fueled by war, is a different kind of cold compared to the massacre war has brought. It is a sad downfall to behold as we witness the brightest star simmers duller by the second. I found myself fondly enjoying the final arc through and through 
While the complicated love triangle can be frustrating to witness due to the nature of such trope, it nonetheless tuckered my heart so and made me invested on all three of them. Even though on paper, ending the show on a high note is more palatable in terms of having a proper payoff and a tighter pacing in general. But prolonging it to cover what follows within the human stories truly brings Macross full circle. From the grandiose, ambitious beginning to the resolves of human affairs, both spectrums getting their ends tied together. The final melancholic ending is a heavy yet hopeful send-off. A humanistic tale lives on. It was an ending that had me sunk in for quite a while, and the withdrawal period was much more surreal, contemplating over their decisions and genuinely hoped the future will turn better for every single one of these characters, who I have come to cherish so dearly. I am extremely glad that I decided to pick up Macross. Having the attitude of exploring ultimately paid off exponentially. My appreciation of the mecha genre has risen another level because of that, and I can already see myself going through all the other entries of the franchise in the future. Just another reason to not ignore or neglect the classics. Relevancy is not always about the hottest topic or the hypest show, but resides in the past as well. Those that established a foundation so strong that not only paves way to the current, but also stood the test of time. I encourage you all to look back sometimes, instead of only seeking for the freshest product out there for a temporary I'm with the time experience. Engage with some older series, classic or not, it doesn't matter. You may start with a genre of your interest or let your gut decide like picking a wild card. You may just be as surprised as me. And that is a very valuable, even educational experience you won't get from just following the current wave. But hey, maybe next time I'll make a video about encouraging people to watch some old classics. Just like the ending of the show, who knows what the future holds but to look forward carrying hope. A cruel galactic war and a roller coaster love story intermingled by emotions. A show worthy of the classic label for time on end. Macross is nothing short of amazing. This video is one of many pre-produced content I've lined up to upload weekly, an attempt to carve a place for myself on YouTube. It took a lone man over a year to prepare this dozen or so videos, so if you have enjoyed it and wish to see more content from me in the future, I humbly ask you to subscribe to my channel as a support. It is the best way to show support for now, and I appreciate every single one of you who would do so or simply decided to spend your time watching this far. Leave a comment and tell me how do you feel about Macross, how was your experience, or has this video enticed you enough to give it a try? I personally would like to know which song is your favorite in this original entry. My boyfriend is a pilot is my choice, even though the purpose behind the song is rather sinister to put it vaguely. Only wish it is longer in length, short but sweet nonetheless. Also, you can find me on Twitter at MoonAnime9. That's it for now and I'll see you from the moon. Jikai on MoonAnime